My dearest Lucy, it seems an age since I heard from you, or indeed since I wrote. You will pardon me, I know, for all my faults when you have read all my budget of news. Well, I got my husband back all right. When we arrived at Exeter, there was a carriage waiting for us, and in it, though we had an attack of gout, Mr. Hawkins. He took us to his house, where there were rooms for us all, nice and comfortable, and we dined together. After dinner, Mr. Hawkins said, My dears, I want to drink your health and prosperity, and may every blessing attend you both. I know you both from children, and have with love and pride seen you grow up. Now I want you to make your home here with me. I have left to me neither chick nor child. All are gone, and in my will I have left you everything. I cried, Lucy dear, as Jonathan and the old man clasped hand. Our evening was a very, very happy one. So here we are, installed in this beautiful old house, and from both my bedroom and the drawing room I can see the great elms of the cathedral close, with their great black stems standing out against the old yellow stone of the cathedral, and I can hear the rocks overhead crawling, cawing and cawing, and chattering and chattering and gossiping all day after the manner of rooks and humans. I am busy, I need not tell you, arranging things and housekeeping. Jonathan and Mr. Hawkins are busy all day, for now that Jonathan is a partner, Mr. Hawkins wants to tell him all about the clients. How is your dear mother going, getting on? I wish I could run up to town for a day or two to see you, dear, but I dare not go yet with so much on my shoulders, and Jonathan wants looking after still. He's beginning to put some flesh on his bones again, and he was terribly weakened by the long illness. Even now, he sometimes starts out of his sleep in a sudden way and wakes all trembling until I can coax him back to his usual placidity. However, thank God these occasions grow less frequent as the days go on, and they will in time pass altogether, I trust. And now I have told you my news. Let me ask yours. When are you to be married, and where, and who is to perform the ceremony, and what are you to wear? And is it to be a public or private wedding? Tell me all about it, dear. Tell me about everything, for there is nothing which interests you which will not be dear to me. Jonathan asked me to send his respectful duty, but I will do. But I do not think that is good enough from the junior partner of the important firm Hawkins and Harker, and so as you love me, and he loves me, and I love you with all the moods and tenses of the verb, I send you simply his love instead. Goodbye, my dearest Lucy, and blessings on you. Yours, Mina Harker. Report from Patrick Hennessy to John Seward, September 20th. My dear sir, in accordance with your wishes, I enclose report of the conditions of everything left in my charge. With regard to patient Renfield, there is more to say. He has had another outbreak which might have had a dreadful ending, but which, as it fortunately happened, was unattended with an, any unhappy result. This afternoon a carrier's cart with two men made a call at the empty house whose grounds about abut on ours. The house to which you will remember the patient twice ran away. The men stopped at our gate to ask the porter their way as they were strangers. I was, myself, looking out at the study window, having a smoke after dinner, and saw one of them come up to the house. As he passed the window of Renfield's room, the patient began to rate him from within, and called him all the foul names he could lay his tongue to. The man, who seemed a decent fellow enough, contented himself by telling him to shut up for the foul-mouthed beggar, whereon our man accused him of robbing him and wanting to murder him, and said that he would hinder him if he were to swing for it. I opened the window and signed uh, to the man not to notice, so he contended himself after looking the place over and making up his mind as to what cause of place he had got to by saying, Lord, Bless your sir. I wouldn't mind what was said to me in the Blossom Madhouse. I pity yet and the governor for having to live in the house with a wild beast like that.
Then he asked his way civilly enough, and I told him where the gate of the empty house was. He went away, followed by threats and curses, and revilings from our men. I went down to see if I could make out any cause for his anger, which he is usually such a well-behaved man, and except his violent fits, nothing of the kind had ever occurred. I found him, to my astonishment, quite composed and most genial in his manner. I tried to get him to talk of the incident, but he blandly asked me questions as to what I meant, and led me to believe that he was completely oblivious of the affair. I was, I am sorry to say, however, only another instance of his cunning, for within half an hour I heard of him again. The time he had broken broken out through the window of his room, and was running down the avenue. I called to the attendants to follow me, and ran after him, for I feared he was intent on some mischief. My fear was justified when I saw the same cart which had passed before coming down the road, having on it some great wooden boxes. Uh, the men were wiping their foreheads, and were flushed in the face, as if with violent exercise, but I could not get up to him. The patient rushed at them, and pulling one of them off the cart, began to knock his head against the ground. If I had not seized him just at the, as the moment, at the moment, I believe he would have killed the man there and then. The other fellow jumped down and struck him over the head with the butt end of his heavy whip. It was a horrible blow. But he did not seem to mind it, but seized him also, and struggled with the three of us, pulling us to and fro, as if we were kittens. You know, I am no lightweight, and the others were both burly men. At first, he was silent in his fighting, but as we began to master him, and the attendants were putting a straight waistcoat on him, he began to shout, I'll frustrate them. They shan't rob me. They shan't murder me by inches. I'll fight for my lord and master, and all sorts of similar incoherent ravings. It was with very considerable difficulty that they got him back to the house and pull, put him in the padded room. One of the attendants, Hardy, had a finger broken. However, I said it all right, and he was going on well. The two carriers were at first loud in their threats of actions for damages, and promised to rain all of the penalties of the law on us. Their threats were, however, mingled with some sort of indirect apology for the defeat of the two of them by a feeble madman. They said that if it had not been for the way their strength had been spent in carrying and raising the heavy boxes to the cart, they would have made short work of him. They gave us they gave as another reason for their defeat the extraordinary state of Drolf, to which they had been reduced by the dusty nature of their occupation and the reprehensible distance from the scene of their labors of any place of public entertainment. I quite understood their draft, and after a stiff glass of strong grog, or rather, more of the same, and with each a sovereign in hand, they made light of the attack and swore that they would encounter a worse madman any day for the pleasure of meeting so booming good a bloke as your correspondent. I took their names and addresses in case they might be needed. They are as follows. Jack Smollett of Dudding's Rents, King George's Road, Great Walmouth, and Thomas Schnelling, Peter Farley's Row, Guide Court, Benthnell Green. They are both in the employment of Harrison Sons, Moving and Shipment Company, Orange Masters Yard, Soho. I shall report to you any matter of interest occurring here, and shall wire you at once if there is anything of importance. Believe me, dear sir, yours faithful, Patrick Hennessy.